Hey guys, Brian Beeler here, and thanks for joining us for the Storage Review podcast. On this week's podcast, I've got Alex Kantrowitz. He's the author of Always Day One, How the Tech Titans Plan to Stay on Top Forever. We've got a really great conversation going on this podcast. He covers off on a lot of the big companies, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, Google. So join us in this conversation. I think you're really going to like it. Alex Kantrowitz, Always Day One. So Alex, before we dive into the book, give us a little bit of background on on your history as a as an author and writer covering tech amongst other things in your your background. So I'm a tech reporter, senior tech reporter for BuzzFeed based here in San Francisco. So I cover the big tech companies, largely been focused on Facebook, Twitter, Google. Um, and before I did the book, I had done some stuff on Amazon and Microsoft and Apple, um, but not an overwhelming amount. Uh, and And so... I came to the book because uh, I studied industrial and labor relations at Cornell. And it's sort of a weird background for a tech reporter to have this labor studies background. Um, But what it did was it it helped me go in to these companies with my antennas up and looking at their culture and leadership, because that's where I believe companies' success and failures always, almost always stem from is how they're run on the inside. And having looked at the culture, I just realized that... um, there's going to be a new way that we work and there's going to be a new way that we lead companies. Um, the tech giants have a head start figuring this out largely because of the technology they have inside. And that's why they're lapping the economy. And to me, like seeing this on the ground floor, uh, it became important to me to, to, uh, write down what I was seeing and then share it with the world. And that's sort of how I came into the book. So it really isn't your typical tech reporter book. It's not a history of these companies. It's not, um, you know, a story about my, you know, my reporting from the front row at, you know, at, you know, in the press conferences or something. It really is a book about the nature of work and how I believe it's going to change. Well, it's interesting because, you know, we're in a similar business, our emphasis being on enterprise IT, but I have sat in probably as many keynotes as, as you have and listened to the leaders expouse their, uh, their beliefs and their new products and all these other things. And, uh, sometimes it's it's easy to get wrapped up into the product and and not have the visibility to pull back a little bit and look at the company so from that perspective i appreciate what you did here as you looked at uh what google apple microsoft uh amazon i'm missing one what's the other facebook one? yeah facebook right yeah um, and by the way that's the manage- exactly sorry i don't mean to cut you off but that's exactly right like this is um you know we almost always focus on the outputs or the symptoms right like what does the machine spit out, um, or you know, and so we don't go any any deeper into that usually because there's not there's not often room to do that in a news story, um, and so that's what no, this book there, is about. There's not. Yeah, and it's about the, so I I just thought that this was important. Let's talk about the machine, talk about the physiology, and then we can understand the outputs and the and and the symptoms, um, versus trying to back into it the other way around. Yeah, and so core to your. Uh, writing is is the concept that you've defined as the engineer's mindset, or at least that's what stood out to me as as the. Uh, well, you tell me, is that what you believe is important for these companies to be successful? And maybe dive into a little bit more about what you mean by engineer's mindset. That's right. So when I think about how they structure work, um, I think the tech giants do something very well, which is that they've broken work out into two different categories, and they might not use these labels, but philosophically, this is what all of them have done on the inside. So they, if you look at work in two, t- in two buckets, right? One bucket is execution work, everything we do to support an existing product that can be moving numbers from one sh- uh, spreadsheet to another, that can be you know, sending the same invoices every, every, uh, every few months, that could be figuring out how to price things. Uh, these all support existing businesses. And the other type of work is called idea work. Um, and idea work is anything that's involved in building a new company. I'm sorry, building a new, a new project or service, you know, coming up with ideas, figuring out how they're going to work and then bringing them to life. And almost all the businesses in the world right now are stuck on execution work. And that makes sense. Okay, we're all supporting our flagship products. Um, and it takes a lot of work to, um, to help support them. And I think that, um, you know, anybody in the enterprise IT work, IT world knows this well, uh, that we're starting to see technology being used to minimize execution work. And what the tech giants do well is they don't fire people once they've minimized that execution work. They actually put them 
on more idea tasks. So you have people inside these tech giants spending way more time than most other companies thinking of new ideas and bringing them to life. And the engineer's mindset, which you mentioned, is what you, what you do next. Once you have that time for idea work and your employees are coming up with ideas, these tech giants are really good at building systems that take the ideas and find a way to bring them to decision makers as fast as possible. And then if they're good, bring them to life. So it's a two, there's two prongs to it, right? It's to minimize execution work, make room for idea work, and then build the systems that can get the ideas to decision makers to bring them to life. So it's interesting to me because you talk about a couple different companies, uh, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and Apple, all that have big cloud exposure. And we think about in, in our world at Storage Review, we, we talk with companies and all the time, both on the IT service provider side and from the uh, users or consumers of these products. And I think we all look at the cloud as sort of as a unmitigated success, right? AWS is huge, Azure is huge, GCP uh, is maybe a little bit behind, but uh, is, is coming along. Apple, while their cloud take is more end user focused, still, where would we be now without iPhones that sync automatically and our photos that just sort of zip around? And we don't, it, the end user doesn't think about it anymore. And a lot of businesses don't really think about it anymore. New apps are born in the cloud. I mean, it's just the way things happen. But the way they got there is really different. And you talk a little bit about uh, that in, in the early part of the book around Amazon's culture and how they bring ideas to light. And then Microsoft took a very different approach to eventually getting to the cloud. Could you talk a little bit about those two, not necessarily against each other, but they both got really successful cloud businesses in very different ways. Yes, yeah, so my uh, chapter on Amazon is called Jeff Bezos's Culture of Invention. And it talks about how Amazon is so good at inventing products. I mean, and one of the ways that they do this very well is they have this, and the book's title is Always Day One. It's a, it's a term that Jeff Bezos uses. You know, people think that Always Day One. I was kind of hesitant. Do we want to use this title? Because it sort of connotes hustle porn. Like Always Day One, okay, you have to work <laughs> nights and weekends and holidays. And do we, is that really the message we want to be sending? But we decided to stick with it. And, and what it really means is not work your butt off, although certainly people inside Amazon do that. It's you have to view each day as if it's your first, so you can't get precious about your uh, your legacy businesses, and you got to keep inventing new ones, otherwise you're going to be left behind. So the average uh, Fortune 500 company lasted about 70 years in the 1920s. Today it's about 15 years. That's why this stuff is so important. You know, companies that prioritize their flagship business and want to run it, uh, it, you know, basically milk that asset until there's nothing left. Those are the ones that are going to end up dropping out, and the companies that are continually inventing are the ones that are going to be doing well. So, you know, if you look at Amazon's progression, it's pretty unbelievable the amount of times they've gone back to day one and, and uh, transformed themselves. They started out as an online bookstore, as everyone knows. Sure. Then they became a third-party marketplace where, uh, sorry, I skipped the, the fact that they sold everything that, there, that exists on the internet uh, through a fir first-party marketplace. Then they became a third-party marketplace, logistics and fulfillment operations uh, uh, services. Um, then, obviously, cloud services platform, voice computing, uh, hardware, not to mention an Academy Award-winning movie studio and a grocer. So they've gone back to day one many, many times. And so because of this, it's no surprise that Amazon was first out of the gate with cloud services. And the way, you know, it's a famous story, the way that that um, sort of sprung up, which is that they had this uh, capacity that they were using internally. And they sort of said, hey, what are we good at? What are our good capacities? How can we sell it? And they came up with the cloud services idea. And the way that the cloud services idea was uh, brought to, to decision makers inside Amazon was through the six pager, which is instead of using PowerPoint uh, inside Amazon, when they want to kick off a big project, the people who want to do it, they write it down in six pages, 11 point font, uh, using, uh, using uh, Calibri text, you know, single spaced. You're really not supposed to cut any corners there. When you write it down, you really have to think through uh, exactly how it's going to be. And actually, when I was speaking to an ex-Amazon employee, he told me it's kind of like write, writing science fiction. They have also fake press releases with fake uh, you know, uh, quotes from executives saying how much they love the products. And when they write the science fiction, they really imagine what the product is going to look like. Then let's say you're a senior leader or even Jeff Bezos and you go sit down to approve it. You don't have to make any of the assumptions in your mind. You read through exactly what it's going to look like. And the six-pager gets it to judgment as quick as possible. So the senior, so when, when they write these pages, everybody inside Amazon sits in a room quietly for about a half hour, reads through it, and then the meeting starts. 
So typically our meetings, we like spend the whole time catching people up on the room on what's happening. And then we might sure. spend 5% of our time on what we should actually do. And because they read the six pager, they, they cut through this time of figuring out what happened. And so, of course, it's no surprise that they were able to get out ahead on, on cloud services and bring Amazon Web Services to life. But the Microsoft, the Microsoft story is kind of wild because it's almost the exact opposite. Microsoft was in this day two mentality with Windows. They had the number one desktop operating system in the world, uh, and they decided they, that they wanted to milk that asset as much as they could um, under Steve Ballmer. And, you know, that's interesting because desktop operating system, which was obviously going obsolete in the age of uh, mobile and the cloud, um, you know, they, they uh, but if, so yeah, having that and then trying to build up a cloud ecosystem sort of didn't make any sense because uh, if you're supporting all these businesses that can build software for the web, um, then people can access it on a Windows machine or uh, an Apple machine or even a Chromebook. So you're, if you decide to build uh, cloud services inside Microsoft, which was already selling on-prem servers, uh, you're essentially hastening the decline of your flagship product. And that's why there was so much resistance, and that's why Azure was so late to the game. But eventually they realized um, that if they decided to run with Windows uh, for much longer, they were really going to miss the boat on a very important computing uh, uh, switch. And their on-prem server would probably end up going to zero anyway. And they even did this study saying that, you know, the CIOs that were telling them they wanted to keep their infrastructure off the cloud were probably going to get fired at a certain point. So that's why they made the switch. So for, for Microsoft, Amazon was already living in this day one mentality. So it was very easy for them to shepherd through the Amazon Web Services and launch it as a product. Microsoft really was in day two. It took someone like Satya Nadella to come in and say, hey, we need to go back to day one or in his words, hit refresh before they ended up launching their cloud services platform. And it ended up scaling pretty fast because Microsoft already had all these good relationships um, with, with the enterprise buyer. I'm sure many of your listeners who had been speaking with Microsoft salespeople for, for years, and then they were able to build a product that, that made sense for them. Well, yeah, and they, they were able to be an alternative too to AWS, right? Because Amazon, and, and actually you got into it a little bit at the, the end of, uh, of the book, Amazon, intends to compete with everyone on almost everything. So here in Cincinnati, where we've got Procter & Gamble, you know, they sell a lot of Tide on Amazon, but Amazon launched a bunch of house brands too, so they're directly competitive. And we look at Walmart and, and others where they're incented to uh, to go look at, at Google Cloud or at uh, Azure because funding their, their uh, competitors seems like a, a less good of an idea, certainly for Procter & Gamble and Walmart and others. Uh, so Microsoft has done well with Azure to to close that gap quickly. It's interesting though too. You know, you talk about rapidly getting there. That wasn't always the mentality at Microsoft, and it's really changed a lot uh, under Nadella. What else do you see there in terms of the future for Microsoft in in the way they work, the way they've adapted? Is it continuing on at that pace? Yeah, I think so. I mean, Microsoft, so the strategy part was easy, right? Deciding, which is crazy, but deciding that they wanted to prioritize other things above Windows um, was sort of the easy decision to make. Um, the hard part inside Microsoft, I mean, relatively easy, but the hard part inside Microsoft was getting a culture that prioritized Windows and, and really wasn't about uh, invention um, to sort of do a, a 180 and start to, to be a culture that could end up acting more like an Amazon or a Facebook or a Google and prioritizing uh, invention over refinement, over building up the flagship product. That takes a lot of work. So um, what they had to do was, uh, they first of all, they restructured the company to make it more collaborative. So typically you'd have Windows and cloud at odds and you might have Windows and devices at, at odds, uh, you know, or sorry, devices and offices at odds because, you know, the devices that Windows made, they all want Office exclusively to help build up uh, their market share and off and office wants to be free everywhere um, not free but you know accessible everywhere freely available yes, yeah sure. freely available so that so that they're not limited to one operating system so how do you uh, handle that tension so Microsoft put them together and they put Windows and cloud together and they say you got to work together the other thing they did was um, so again like I think one of the most important things that these companies can do is build systems to get employees ideas to decision makers and, you know, so that's the six pager in Amazon is one way to do that. Um, there's also, you can also set norms culturally. And 
throughout Steve Ballmer's tenure at Microsoft, uh, the annual meeting was, uh, you know, is kind of, you can watch it on YouTube, it's kind of funny. It was like a dance show where, um, you know, there's lights and music and Ballmer gets up on stage and, you know, does this uh, very spasmodic dance and is screaming at the crowd. A lot of sweating. Yeah, I, he's saying, I love Microsoft. <laughs> and it's all about Ballmer. I love Microsoft. But why do you love Microsoft? Did he ever ask that question, right? And so um, this was sort of like the, the uh, culture inside Microsoft. It was top executives talking at their employees. And Satya transformed that into a hackathon. And a hackathon, I guess, is like a little cliche uh, at this point in Silicon Valley. But actually what it does is it sends a message to the employees inside the company that says, you know, it's not about I love Microsoft. It's why do you and how will you end up, uh, you know, taking ideas that you have and helping make the company better? It shows anybody in the company, can, you know, if they have an idea of how uh, of the next product the company should make or next service, and it doesn't matter which division, which rank they're in, during a company-wide hackathon, you can actually advance that idea and the company will take it seriously and potentially even bring it to life. So what they had to do was take this culture of people talking at each other and make it to one where they listen and appreciated ideas so they'd be able to reinvent themselves. It's a pretty hard turn, uh, honestly, and it's even a little surprising that some of these companies are able to make that pivot that weren't born that way, that weren't ready and, and already had that ingrained. Um, you know, for uh, I've been in tech for a long time, and for a while, Microsoft was uh, had a pocket PC. They had a, a PDA offering. They were sort of into phones a little bit. Uh, and you talked about uh, Nokia a little bit. They made a couple pretty catastrophic acquisitions. And I, I think about the whatever it was, thirteen, fourteen billion in those two, the uh, ad company and the uh, the Nokia acquisition that ended up essentially going to nothing. It's um, it's something that we see a lot in enterprise IT where a vendor's got a gap in the portfolio or a perceived gap, and so they go spend you know, 500 million, a billion, two billion on a product, put it in there, and then you watch as that normally doesn't work all that well. Uh, HPE's done a lot of acquisitions lately, and they've kind of stopped innovating on their own. And it, it concerns me just as an outside observer um, that some organizations are looking still to bolt on acquisitions and uh, have moved away or maybe never even had the engineer's mindset where they're where they're trying to create or, or having a culture to, to facilitate that creation. What do you make of the acquisition model? I mean, clearly, like I said, you outlined those those two failures Microsoft had, but the acquisition model versus the build from within. Yeah, I think so. We, it's no secret that most M&A fails. And to me, I mean, it's, it's not even uh, uh, controversial to say the reason that it fails is because of culture clashes. And the typical way this goes is exactly what happened to Aquaniv when it came into Microsoft. Aquaniv, um, as I write about in the book, is this was this um, ad, ad advertising company. And they had the engineer's mindset, right? They And by the way, I talk about the engineer. An engineer's mindset means that... Um, you know, you, you're, you're living in a culture that values sharing ideas across divisions, and that's typically how an engineer works. So I talk about it in terms of democratically inventing, giving anyone a chance to invent, um, accepting and, and, and giving feedback, um, which is something that happens inside engineer organizations. They're usually feel, they're feeling free to go up to their skip level managers or hire to bring ideas, and then collaboration. Um, you know, they, they're always collaborating with people. And even if, uh, you know, they're typically working on one part of a project where if something fails, um, then the whole system will fail. So they have to be in communication like a power grid. Uh, so this is like something that's not exclusive to engineers. It's just typically the way that they think. And when companies are able to bring this mentality to bear inside their companies, they, gen they tend to do better these days. So what happened was this company, Aquaniv, right, they were acquired by Microsoft they were very flat and flexible and, and doors were open and, and managers appreciated ideas from um, below and side to side. And uh, they, they were, that's why that's how they built themselves into this $6 billion company, which Microsoft found very appealing um, to acquire. Then they come into the company and they find out that it's command and control and they're given orders and they're told to execute um, as opposed to work on ideas. And obviously the whole thing falls apart and it was a $6.3 billion acquisition and $6.2 billion of it got written down, you know, oh, and the, the last $0.1 billion was just a saving face type of thing. So, so this is, it was completely, completely a culture thing. 
And then you fast forward to what happened with LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, is acquired by Microsoft a couple years ago, and it's actually doing quite well. And it's no surprise that it's doing well in a company that's not command and control and not living in this old paradigm of the early knowledge economy where we had people delivering orders from the top down, thinking they're visionaries uh, and, and not letting the rest of the ideas bubble up. And that's sort of a point I make in the book. We've been stuck on this idea that you need to be a visionary to be a good leader. Um, and I think that right now, what the moment really calls for is facilitators. In, in a time where businesses are going to fall out of the Fortune 500 with such speed, you're actually not going to be able to have, rely on one person's ideas on their own. Like the companies that are going to be able to, th to, the companies that are going to be able to thrive are going to be the ones that are going to reinvent themselves, and that requires sourcing ideas from everywhere, not just from one person. Yeah, and a lot of the new ideas that you've talked about, you've gave some good examples both at Amazon and Google around uses of AI, and actually with the Facebook uh, as well. I don't mean to avoid Facebook. I'm one of the few that doesn't tries really hard to not use Facebook. <laughs> I just can't stand that level of, uh, of communication. Uh, but uh, uh, they did a, uh, an interesting machine learning uh, deal with face.com. And so I want to get your take too on AI and machine learning because it's something that we deal with a lot. We see infrastructure providers talk a lot about um, their products being good for uh, AI and ML. And then when we try to dive into that, there's often not much substance behind that because they just assume faster is better and, and faster makes you be able to do more inference and this sort of thing. And while that may be a little bit true, they, they kind of uh, get lost in understanding the business benefits and some of those aspects about how executionally what it means to the business. So what are, what are some of your favorite um, you know, from the book, some of your favorite AI use cases or successes or even failures there, because I think that's something that a lot of businesses are struggling with to understand where machine learning and, and AI can make sense and where it doesn't. Yeah, so to me, one of the most interesting things was going down to this automation conference in Miami, uh, hosted by a company called UiPath. And, you know, this is not the technology they use uses computer vision to be able to um, view your screen, but it's actually not such deep ML underneath the surface. And what they can do is they can watch your tasks as you work and then with a little bit of labeling, automate them. So they can do things like, you know, um, fill out reports in Salesforce and write new hire letters, uh, write termination letters even if it comes to that point. Um, sure. They're able to take all this execution work and minimize it. And what I thought was interesting about it was just being at this conference and seeing the amount of uh, different industries represented. There was automotive, there was retail, there was banking, there was insurance. And seeing that really like set off this light bulb in my head, which is like this type of technology, automation technology, and they can integrate with machine learning now, um, is not going to be something that's limited to the tech giant. It's going to be democratized in a way that it's going to, you know, I walked out of that place and I was like, wow, like this stuff is coming to, you know, the modern workplace much faster than a lot of people believe. So to me, that was something that was super interesting. Now, the problem is that a lot of people at that conference were just looking to, um, you know, cut people or cut tasks without any real broader strategy around it. Like I had someone pull me aside and say, basically, hey, look, we're, we're doing this because we're only interested in FTE reduction, full-time employee reduction. And to mm -hmm. me, that's bonkers uh, because the strategic benefit of this is not being able to do more with less. It's to be able to to, to rebuild or, or reinvent yourself out ahead of the trends that are coming to get you. Because, you know, when you do more with less, what does that mean? It means protect the flagship product, right? And try to run it with less people. And that's what I think the tech giants do so well. So in Amazon, there's a story I tell about a um, initiative called Hands Off the Wheel. And Amazon, like, okay, let's roll with your example with Procter & Gamble, right? Like, well, who's, so how are those tied uh, units getting into fulfillment centers and priced and negotiated? Um, and stocked so that we end up getting the right volume. And uh, the, the, at Amazon, that used to be done by a vendor manager uh, who would have this relationship with the, with the parent company and say, we need this many units and this many fulfill fulfillment centers at this price at this time. And Amazon basically said, we don't need to uh, uh, have our people doing this. We can actually use machine learning to predict exactly how many, you know, we our machine learning can probably do a better job than a person figuring out, you know, where, when to get these units into the um, fulfillment centers at what time. 
And over the course of the last decade, they have been uh, working to automate this, this, these vendor manager responsibilities. So what do Amazon do with the vendor managers? So, you know, a lot of people who haven't seen these systems in action would probably say, oh, yeah, so if you had a vendor manager that used to be able to manage a thousand products, now they can manage a hundred thousand. Well, you just fire the excess. It's definitely not what Amazon did. Now Amazon has moved a lot of these vendor managers into product manager and program manager roles, which means they're basically professional inventors inside Amazon, and they work on bringing new products to life. So they'll think about like how that machine learning, you know, was able to take that execution work down, make room for idea work, um, keep the people on, and have them put on more inventive tasks. And I'll just bring it home with a concrete example. There was a guy named uh, Dilip Kumar who ran pricing and promotion for Amazon. Um, so a very important part of the retail organization. He then uh, spends a year and a half under Jeff Bezos as his technical advisor. Um, and fun fact, uh, the first technical advisor under Jeff Bezos and the technical advisor is someone that just kind of takes all the meetings that he's in, sits in, you know, fly on the wall and sees how he operates. First person that did that was Andy Jassy. Um, and then he got an opportunity to do his own thing afterwards and that became AWS. So Dilip is in the same position as Jassy was a few years before. And by the time he's finished, pricing and promotions is pretty much on autopilot, thanks to hands off the wheel. So he gets to do something else. And what he does is he, um, he takes a group of people uh, in the retail organization and says, let's try to figure out the most annoying part of shopping in real life and see if we can use that, fix that with technology. And so they say, okay, let's build this big vending machine, right? The most annoying part of shopping in real life is is checking out. If you just punch your order in and the vending machine delivers it to you, you won't even have to worry about checkout. They figured out that that was impractical and actually wasn't that much of a benefit to people. So they said, well, what if we take computer vision and sensors and put them in a store that can sense whether or not people, uh, can sense when people take certain items and then just have them scan in, pick the items they want and walk out, no checkout. And that actually became the Amazon Go store, uh, which you can go in and, and that's exactly how it works. You grab the stuff. Uh, and you can you can run outside and pray that they don't uh, catch what you took. But I've done that many times, and I've you never tried, been right? able you, to trick them. You did them. a 16-second yeah, run? Yeah, 16 seconds in and out. They still caught the product. And uh, even after the book is published, my uh, long-running quest to trick Amazon Go continues, and it's been uh, unsuccessful. What was the product? I, I've got to know what you ran in in 16 seconds and got. I, was probably, I think it must have been a Cliff Bar or a Vitamin Water. Like They're like sort of like <laughs> convenience stores. So to me, those are like the go-to go-to items in convenience store. They also have uh, these good microwave lunches. So, but, Oh, gosh. Yeah. Do you think the Go concept will be extensible from 1 to 10,000 units, or is it still too heavy to put that into work in volume? I think Go, yeah, is going to be the future of retail. And especially now, we don't want to spend a lot of time uh, interacting in close proximity touching with other things. people, touching yeah. things, you know, right. breathing on people. And uh, in, in the middle of this moment, to me, it seems like Go is supposed to take supposed to take off. It's already expanding throughout the U.S. and they've already put it into a bigger grocery store as a test. And Jeff Bezos, if you read his uh, shareholder letters, um, which are always a good read, he's uh, noted that Go is an important part of Amazon's retail strategy moving forward. So yes, I believe that they're gonna they're gonna grow in a big way. And the only reason that was able that you know they were able to do it wasn't because Jeff Bezos snapped the fingers and said, "Let's make this happen." It was a cultural thing that ended up producing this store. All right, so what happens when things go the other way? You talk a little bit about uh, one of Google's projects, Maven, where where the AI, well, may have been effective, but led to problematic issues within the organization. Um, talk a little bit about that and what orgs have to do to sort of prioritize and communicate their AI projects. Yeah, I mean, I think that so Google, Google's employee base really protested their work on Maven, um, which was this project and, that right. gave um, gave technology to drones and could potentially have been used to autonomously target, although it's still kind of in question whether or not that was going to be the case. Um, and the employees protested over it in a big way. Um, so, you know, I have this chapter at the end of the book that call, that's called Leader of the Future. And it goes into like, you know, we used to think that the leader is just someone that inspires and motivates employees. But now the a concept of a leader in a company is actually much broader, given the responsibilities they have, you know, to society as well and how their products can impact society. So I do think that they need to be able to consider, consider the ethical implications of the algorithms they develop, of the technology they develop. And most importantly, when it goes wrong, to disclose. 
uh, Amazon had this recruiting algorithm that they were using a machine learning program. And um, what it did was it looked at the inputs. Uh, this is I, I'll leave, this is my read of it, right? It looked at the inputs and it saw Amazon is mostly male. So it started filtering out people who with characteristics that could show that they were female, not even if they listed female on their um, on their uh, uh, application. Like it would say like women's club, right? Women's but if college, they went to women's college, right? Yeah, you're out. So it got that smart that it knew to filter women out. Um, and uh, obviously, you know, that's just as uh, you know. The, the intelligence on that on that front is um, is not smart. It's uh, it's using this faulty logic um, and and judgment that uh, you know that sort of amplifies the biases that were there beforehand. Um, well, that's always the issue though yeah. with with software. The software engineers always say mm -hmm. you know the the app does what it what the writer told it to do. The AI. Mm -hmm has to weight inputs and somewhere along the way human has to tell it how to weight those inputs right that's right yeah and and i would say so human has to tell how to report how to weight the inputs and actually in amazon's case uh they 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 couldn't figure out a way to retrain the algorithm so it wouldn't be <laughs> so discriminatory which is away. freaking believable uh, <laughs> yeah so so they had to 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 throw it away um and honestly like uh, so I, so I spoke an expert about this and she said like the one, the, you know, the one thing about Amazon is that they disclosed, right? They disclosed it and most companies don't disclose. So I think that like when you have an algorithm like this, you know, that thinks that the right thing to do is discriminate against women. You not only have to shut that down right away, um, or discriminate against any other group. You don't only, only shut that down. You divulge and let people know, Hey, this is where it went wrong. And it might be embarrassing and Amazon didn't do it right. It was, a uh, a reporter that ended up getting the scoop and bringing it out to light and Amazon just admitted it. Um, but yeah, you divulge, you divulge. And then um, when you do that, uh, then you give other people who are doing similar things an opportunity to, to check their systems to make sure they're not doing the same thing. Well, it, it's funny. How do you, <laughs> so it came out and it's, it's just hard to imagine that an AI could be sexist or racist or, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, it, it, I don't know. Is that just a societal thing where our biases get carried on to the technology overtly or by accident? Oh, definitely. I mean, okay, so here's an example. Microsoft had this uh, chat bot called Tay. I don't know if uh, you remember <laughs> yeah. it, but I actually yes. broke the news that at Microsoft was releasing this thing. And we wrote the story. Uh, and it was supposed to be this fun chat bot that... Um, that uh, you know just kind of interacts with teens and learns its personality as it goes. And okay, well we're we're Buzzfeed, so that seemed like a good uh, uh, story for our audience. Um, and of course, it's all about the inputs, right? And so the internet realized that there was this uh, bot that would interact with people, and they just did what they do, which is they tried to you know a bunch of bad actors tried to get Tay to say racist things and terrible things. And uh, they turned it into a Nazi overnight. And I woke up after the story of this story pinned on my Twitter profile. And I woke up and someone's like, oh, you probably want to remove that. I'm like, remove it. Like, you know, it's just this kind of um, harmless Twitter bot. What could have happened? And I looked down my time. I'm like, oh, it's a Nazi. You know, yeah. so it's like, so yeah, it is. It is all about the inputs. And that's why we have to monitor the inputs. And actually, like, you know, these things, they, they do amplify uh, they do, they amplify like the worst of human behavior. So we got to be careful to make sure that we put that in check. Well, that one was almost a challenge though. It was like throwing down the gauntlet to the internet saying, how bad can we make this? And you get yeah. you know, groups of people, uh, on, uh, on a variety of websites that collaborate. It is an interesting study though on collaboration, isn't it? To have all these independent people, even though it was a bad outcome working together to try to make a vision for this AI. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's one way to look at it. I guess you could call it a good <laughs> collaboration thing. But I would say, yeah, well, yeah. You, know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you went into uh, a little bit of a, uh, a, a pretend part of the book, uh, your Black mm. Mirror chapter, where you talk about the future of, of, of things going bad. And I think a lot of us imagine ways like Nazi bot, where technology can go bad if if not managed or or you know attended to or nurtured um you went through a couple of little fun little vignettes there do you worry at all or maybe you want to explore one of those do you worry at all about technology 
changing in negative ways? Yeah. So, you know, we talked a little bit about the Amazon six pager and how it was like writing science fiction. At least that's the way they say it. Um, but it only uh, those six pagers only have happy endings, right? They don't imagine how the product that they can build in the future go wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to sell your vision. Right? If it's going to be negative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we know that not every product ends up doing something good. I mean, case in point, Tay, right? So um, we, I, I do think that technology firms need to hire science fiction writers um, and, and have them you know, put into their product development process to give them an idea of where things could go wrong. Uh, and that's what I did for the book. I had a sci- an award-winning science fiction writer and someone who was responsible for starting uh, part of the Arab Spring uh, show up to my apartment and we had a dinner. And I said, listen, here's all the technology that I have uh, outlined in the book. Can you uh, help me figure out a way to, um, yeah, can you help me figure out a way to think about how it could go wrong? And we had like this uh, a pretty amazing night where like, you know, I'd been speaking to technologists the whole time. And now all of a sudden we get, you know, really into like the deep, dark problems that could happen um, with the technology. And I feel like if we have more adversarial thinkers like them built into the product development process, we're going to end up, um, you know, with much fewer situations where like, you know, product releases and then halfway through the cycle, the CEO is or, or the leaders of the product owners spend almost all their time explaining away the bad things that happened. Um, there was this one example that we spoke about, which is like what happens if somebody like a government plants somebody into Google and uses their collaboration software to sort of turn the employee base against, you know, a certain person that, that is of interest to the government. And then one day somebody from Google just goes and cracks and exposes their information and the person gets killed. And, you know, we thought, OK, this is pretty outlandish, but it could happen. And then a couple of months later, um, I found out that there were two men accused. Uh, the FBI released this complaint where there were two men accused uh, inside Twitter of working in cahoots with um, you know people very close to the Saudi royal family and accessing all the information, like including IP addresses of dissidents against the Saudi uh, royal family. Um, and that that case is working its way through the courts right now. So I think that you know what would have happened if Twitter would have had some more adversarial thinkers. You know, maybe an ex-intelligence official like they have inside Facebook now or some science fiction writers telling them, hey, you know, your systems, you should probably protect those systems because you never know. There might be a chance that a foreign government might be interested in that very uh, precious information that you have and want to use it in a bad way. Yeah, why not? Right. I mean, there's a lot of that those types of stories pulled from reality. It doesn't have to be science fiction that we've seen. uh you know, Chinese nationals that have tried to work their way into uh, into companies to to get access to IP. I mean, it's not it's not that ridiculous, and not even mm-hmm. a foreign actor that would be involved in it could be any employee that stumbles across something and says, "Oh, this might be this might be useful or or worth something if I go sell it to mm-hmm. you know not even a competitor, but to whoever might be interested." It. Uh, it is scary, uh, I think, in, in some real non-Terminator sort of ways where, where we do have to be concerned about checks and balances on this technology. And do we rely on these companies to do it? They've already shown themselves to be not great stewards of our, of our information. I mean, Facebook, obviously, with the Cambridge Analytica, was one of the most visible recently. But what do you think about leaving these companies, and I'm certainly not advocating for more government anything, but Mm -hmm. what do you think about their ability to regulate themselves and and maintain that level of honesty and in some cases transparency to make sure to protect them? Yeah, I don't trust them to regulate themselves as long as they don't have fear of being regulated by somebody else. And Mm -hmm. right now they're they're doing uh, self-regulation, but I don't really think it's um, sufficient. And the reason why they're doing it is because they know they're more powerful than the FTC. You know, we've had candidates mm-hmm. that have run on these platforms of breaking up the tech giants. What, what if we just had a, a candidate that ran on the platform of, you know what, if elected, I will fund the FTC to actually make them have some teeth versus, you know, when they when the FTC fined Facebook, I think it was $5 billion, uh, they said we could have gone for more, but we just didn't have the firepower. <laughs> like, come on, like, you know, if, yeah, if our regulatory ridiculous. agencies understand that they're weak, then they'll never be able to actually um, make any of these companies fear the consequences. And I think once the companies fear the consequences, then we can start trusting them more to do the self-regulation because they know if they don't, it won't be their choice anymore. But right now they know it's their choice. Well, they're, I mean, we've seen as, as 
Zuckerberg was hauled out in front of uh, Congress and, and others have testified that our, our leaders are not necessarily the most sophisticated or capable to be diving into these types of conversations. It's a whole new, it's a whole new mentality. And if, if you make the argument that FTC should have more teeth and, and I haven't investigated it, but I don't have reason to dispute that concept, how do we get people to go do that job that are as capable as these companies that are so fast, so dynamic, they're everything the government isn't? I mean, it's it's got to be one of the biggest challenges you know, maybe in the world to be able to staff our government with, with good thinkers. Yeah, and, and actually competent folks um, at well, the right. top. So, what, so yeah. how do we do that? Well, look, I think you're starting to see a a movement in politics where people who understand technology are starting to run because they understand that this is an important part of our economy and we need to be able to figure out a way to to harness it in a way that leaves society better off. Like it's becoming a mission to people. I think it's uh, not surprising where you saw Andrew Yang become the first Mm -hmm. uh, essentially tech candidate, right, to get pretty far in a major party primary. I think he was was like fairly remarkable in that sense that the issues that he was talking about resonated with people in a way that that gave him like a, a pretty good uh, group of fans, and that might signal to other people who have you know knowledge of technology um, that they want to run. I know Mark Cuban is talking about running as an independent uh, right now in 2020. I think his run is more likely in 2024, but that guy certainly understands technology. I mean, he read the book. Uh, I mean, he's in the book. He read the book and um, gave me some pretty good feedback on it. Um, constructive feedback, which was helpful. And he's talking about how big and small companies can use AI, uh, you know, now when he's discussing a potential platform. So yeah, I think we're going to start to see it's going to be like a light drawing people in, um, people, politicians that know technology. And then the other thing is going to be time. I mean, I really do think that like our generation of politicians in the US is pretty old right now. And, um, and over time, yeah. you're going to get people who've who've grown up or who've, who've come to technology and really understand it and, and get that you don't use WhatsApp to send an email. Um, and over, you know, once that happens, um, I think we're going to start to see some, some real consequences. But this is how it, how it usually goes, right? The political system is always a little bit slower than the private sector. Um, and so it's going to take some time to catch up, but it will. Yeah, you're right. I mean, Yang was definitely out there talking about data in the way where he really understood that you know, Google and Facebook and all these other guys are using our data, monetizing our data, and we're not being necessarily compensated for that. You can, you can sort of agree or, or not with his universal income idea based off mm-hmm. of that that notion. But you're right that he he definitely um, appealed to certainly younger voters that understand these concepts around around data about what they're doing with it about you know whether or not our data can ever be deleted or forgotten even if we want it to you know leaving mm-hmm. gdpr and some of the things that europe's doing aside the efficacy of these of these things is all still to be determined um as you think about going forward though so you talked about some interesting things there you went through a traditional education process and and have, have built a career do you think that and this is so selfish. I've got a 17-year-old that's uh, mm-hmm. that's in this, uh, you know, this school COVID school nonsense right now, and will hopefully have a, a real senior year. But um, this disruption is making a, a lot of people, a lot of parents, I think, rethink education. And a lot of what you talk about isn't really focused on education, but I think about the skills required for this next generation of of worker. Is the traditional high school college you know grad school maybe does that does that system still work for teaching kids and what do they need to know because i feel like you know talking with you that they in reading the book that they need to be able to be creative thinkers and dynamic and adaptable and i'm not sold that that's necessarily what we're churning out the back end of the school system yeah, I agree. I think the system's broken right now. And I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I don't have the solutions, but I do know the problem, right? And when it really became apparent to me. So, um, you know, again, I study labor relations. I go back in the last chapter to speak with some of the professors in the school to talk about how the world of work has changed in the last 15 years. Um, and, you know, one of the things they really, and I was like, so how do we handle this automation thing? And one of the professors is like, don't worry about the automation, worry about the education. 
Because as long as we're working in an education system, which is teaching kids to memorize and spit back and optimize towards A pluses, we're not going to get the thinkers that are going to be able to uh, live in this more inventive economy. You need like creativity and originality and initiative um, in this new world. And we're teaching memorization and the ability to spit back. And to, to him, that was the thing that was uh, the biggest problem was conformity. And we have to find a way to teach nonconformity and out of the box thinking. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to teach a generation of kids to do actions that are pretty easy to automate. You know, machine learning is pretty good at memorizing and spit back. It's pretty good at <laughs> optimizing towards a, a plus. It's, it's, it's worse at inventing new products. And that's where um, our ingenuity is, is our, is our you know, competitive advantage against the technology. And that's where we need to be investing. Well, the creativity is not something we typically get out of out of AI. We don't get art, and I I know that's a broad generalization, mm -hmm. and people make you know AI and bots that go create things, but it's not it's not the same, really. You're still missing the human element, which is unless we want to live in a software robot overlord sort of post apocalyptic future, humans are still somewhat important in this process, I think. Um, so what? So if the system's broken, is is college still the best bet for high school seniors, or is there some other way to get the education and still be employed by these um, by these companies that you write about? Do they still value college the same way? Just what are your what are your thoughts on on higher level education? Yeah, I think college is going to be an important signaling uh, piece of information that if you get a degree, then you're sort of, you show that, that you've been through the system and employers are gonna look for that. Whether it puts you in the best position or not to uh, succeed in this economy is an open question. Um, but I wouldn't dissuade someone from going to college who wants to. What I would say is that, um, and again, I don't know exactly how what the new education would look like, but we do need a new education and we need our best education and policy thinkers to huddle together and think about a way to create, um, to create education that inspires uh, the thinking that can make people you know, excel at idea work instead of execution work. Our, our education system is built off of this uh, old knowledge economy paradigm, right? Where it's like they wanted to create people that were basically docile and would, would execute and help sustain a company. And we're not living in that world anymore. So I think the education system needs to change. Um, and yeah, I, I think that um, once students go through it, I don't know if there's like a right mix of... Um, of high school and college and grad school, everyone needs to sort of figure that one out on their own um, in terms of what makes sense for them. Um, but certainly, if our education systems are working a lot, are, are working better, they'll be much better investments than they are today. Yeah, I, it's uh, as a parent, it's an interesting thing to to figure out. Uh, certainly, amidst uh, all the talk of student loan debt and all these other challenges, and what what are the fall semesters even going to look like for colleges based in Mm -hmm. on uh, what we still can't quite predict. Um, you know, let me ask you one more question. I want to give you this this idea. Maybe this will be for your next book. But uh, it's my theory that the best way to judge a company's progressiveness and their ability to, to succeed is to evaluate their break rooms. Now, I don't know if you've done this before, but the break rooms that have the best stuff tend to be the most creative companies. And the break rooms with a Coke machine with a dollar changer on it that doesn't even take Apple Pay tend to lack creativity. Is, am I mm -hmm. off base on that analysis? Well, yeah, I think this is a way that um, a, an employer can signal to people well, that they value them, ah, that they value their ideas. So, you know, I, I think, all right, so I've definitely been in the Silicon Valley campuses with sort of the absurd, uh, uh, you know, canteens and lunchrooms and, you know, mini uh, kitchens and all that stuff. It's, it's got to be nice to work there. Uh, although I definitely would, would gain twice my body weight in just a couple mm -hmm. of months. Um, but what it shows is you're an owner in this too. You know, that even, and stock options, right? You're an owner in this too. We value you. It doesn't matter what part of the, you know, supply chain you're in or sorry, the, the uh, organizational totem pole, like you, you matter here. Um, and so I've been in stock options and beef jerky or the, the, <laughs> The, the two ways to get they, most they, success. Huh? I would say that they're one part of it. But to me, like, if you ask me what's going to make a successful company, I really think it's the systems that I outline in the book. You know, find ways to minimize that execution work, make room for idea work, and then figure out ways. 
to get those ideas to decision makers. And this is, you know, the kitchens and, and the stock options are part of it. And it's also just giving permission to people to say, we want your ideas. That's one of Amazon's leadership principles. It's, it's simple, but it's, it's important to think big. It's telling the employees to think big. Whereas most employees, you know, they, a lot of people, we are very creative. We come into companies, we give all these ideas. And we wait, okay, okay, when, when are these ideas gonna get turned in? And then we figure out like two years in, they're like, oh, they didn't actually want my ideas. They just wanted me to fulfill this one task. And that's what yeah. I'm doing and they don't value it. And that's what the tech giants do well is they incentivize uh, and, and they, they signal to their employees that actually, yes, your ideas matter. And as people read through the book, they'll see time after time when, uh, when the leaders actually listen to their employees' ideas. That's when the biggest changes happen for the company, not the visions coming from the top. So you, you titled the book Always Day One. Is, uh, I don't know if you want to be pinned down on this, but is Amazon your favorite from the book in terms of culture and your admiration? Uh, you know, it's difficult to say I admire Amazon's culture because of all of the um, the the problems they have in terms of workers working people so hard, and um, you know, right now what's going on in the fulfillment centers. You know, they've they fired some people that have spoke up for worker conditions. Spoken out, right? It seems like this would be the time where you want to listen to those people most. Um, what I will say is that Amazon definitely has, um, to me, a process and technology combination that's most suited for the world we live in today. Um, I think all the tech giants do this in their own way, but I think that Amazon's process is something that uh, a lot of people can learn from. And, you know, I think the problem, we have a problem because these tech giants, companies like Amazon, um, you know, people view them as unbeatable and unknowable and therefore don't, you know, even bother trying to get into their businesses and learning about them. Um, and because of that, they just continue to lap the economy. But I think the more that we are able to incorporate their processes into our workplaces, uh, the better chance we're going to have at, at at least giving them a run for their money. Well, I, I love the book. I read it uh, all the way through, found it really insightful. It's definitely appreciate it. Uh, Alex, where can people find the book? Amazon, of course. Where, where else can mm -hmm. they find you? Yeah, it's Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, IndieBound. You can just type Always Day One into Google and, and you can find it. I'm sure there's a bunch of different places. Or you type it into Bing if you're that type of person. Um, you could also find me uh, on Twitter. I'm pretty online, so I'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, my handle is Kantrowitz, K-A-N-T-R-O-W-I-T-Z. All right, Alex, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Great book, uh, and uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. I'd like to thank Alex again for joining us on the podcast. Fantastic conversation. Get the book. Check it out. It's an easy read uh, with profiles on uh, on a lot of great companies that we all deal with on a on a day-to-day -day basis uh, let us know how things are going out there hit us at info at storagereview.com visit our subreddit slash storage review if you want to talk storage or comment on our articles and reviews uh, youtube's been a little bit slower due to uh, shipping and receiving being a little bit light lately but we're about to uh, put up a, a backlog of things, including the podcasts on there. So check out the YouTube channel as well. And uh, no matter what, thanks for listening. Bye-bye.